All right, everyone, good morning and welcome to EAB University. I am Robin Osborne and I'm coming to you from Michigan State University and welcome to this spring 2019 webinar series, which is funded by the USDA Forest Service. Along with my EAB University colleagues, Cliff Sadoff and Elizabeth Barnes from Purdue University and Amy Stone from The Ohio State University, we welcome you to today's webinar on an update on practical EAB management presented by Cliff Sadoff. Cliff is no stranger to EAB University as he has been a presenter of invaluable information about Emerald Ash Borer for many years. Nationally, he has been one of the most important entomologists in the research and extension of all things EAB. We are fortunate today to have him presenting the latest on the management of this devastating invasive wood pests. <clears throat> if you have questions for Cliff during the presentation, type them in the chat feature and we will respond to them after the webinar presentation. After today's presentation, we will be sending you an email link to a short voluntary confidential survey that we hope you will take the time to fill out. It helps us bring these free educational webinars to you. For those of you wanting CEUs and CCH credits, I will be sending you information on how to obtain these in the aforementioned email. Thank you for attending today, everyone. And Cliff, I'm going to, oh, I've got your um, mic unmuted and you can begin your presentation. All right. Well, thank you very much, Robin. It's uh, good to be here this morning. And, uh, you know, I've been doing a little of the math and I realized that Emerald Ash Borer was first detected here in uh, 2002. So it's been 17 years that, since it it's, was detected. And I think we've learned an awful lot of tricks uh, about how to uh, manage it. Unfortunately, it came at a cost of a lot of uh, ash trees in, in our area. But uh, I hope to share with you some of the latest uh, techniques and thoughts on uh, managing emerald ash borer. And um, I wanted to start off okay, uh, by, by acknowledging uh, the fact that this was not a single effort. Uh, you know, I worked with a, a lot of my university colleagues and students, uh, funding from lots of different agencies uh, responsible for being able to get me this information to you. Uh, so, uh, what I want to show you here is a picture of Fort Wayne, Indiana. Okay, Fort Wayne, uh, Fort Wayne uh, is where emerald ash borer was detected in Indiana uh, about 11 years ago. And uh, I, I took this picture last summer uh, on, on Clinton Street in the, the center of Fort Wayne, which is where these trees are the pet trees of, of the mayor's office. Okay, he, he really loves these trees and he wanted those trees protected. And uh, the trees, as you can see, these are ash trees, this little LA, uh, look quite nice. And, you know, many times people who are concerned about emerald ash borer, you know, think that when it comes in, they're going to have to get rid of their trees because, you know, the treated trees are just going to be barely hanging on. I just want to show you these, these, this picture to show you that these are, very healthy ash trees, and they're contributing greatly to the uh, quality of life in the city of Fort Wayne. So uh, when I talk about protected trees throughout my talk, I want you to keep this image in mind, you know, that these trees are going to be healthy and vibrant looking, not just little stragglers. So uh, the three key points, uh, the points I want to sort of go over today is that uh, Protection is a reality, and we can actually protect trees now by just injecting them once every three years with a compound called emamectin benzoate. Uh, I know the label says that it should be injected once every two years, but we have uh, definitive data from a number of sources, which I'm going to show today, to uh, demonstrate that you could only treat these trees once every three years. And if you're a city, uh, that means you could treat a third as many trees uh, for the same amount of money. And I hope that comes into play when you're making your decisions on whether, on which trees to protect and which trees to remove. Uh, which brings me to the second point that it is always less expensive to keep trees alive uh, because you can save, uh, because it just costs a lot less uh, over time. And then also over time, as uh, you keep the trees alive, you now have the opportunity to use more improved management tools that could do a better job. 
And then finally, you know, just because we can protect the trees, it doesn't mean we can forget about emerald ash borer. Uh, you're always going to have to monitor the trees for emerald ash borer, uh, even after uh, the initial invasion wave goes through. Okay. So, uh, emerald ash borer. Uh, this is, uh, you see, this picture was taken <coughs> in Indianapolis in the middle of the summertime. You can tell this because all the, uh, most of the trees are alive, the grass are green, and in the center, we have an emerald ash borer, uh, you know, trees that were killed by, by emerald ash borer. Um, I want to alert you to the fact that uh, there's a really nice uh, interactive website on the uh, emeraldashboard.info website right now that gives you uh, an idea of the progression of emerald ash borer over time from its initial detection in 2002 all the way through uh, 2018, and it will be continually updated. So you, there's a little slide bar on the bottom where you can actually slide back and forth uh, to sort of get an idea of where it was at different periods in time. And this is useful uh, for those of you, especially in, in, in the outlying areas, uh, if you want to know uh, where emerald ash borer is. Okay. <clears throat> uh, before I go into some of the technology of control, I, I can't emphasize enough that dead ash trees are a threat to public health. And uh, last week, uh, I, two weeks ago, I was uh, at a meeting in Indianapolis, uh, and Tim Walsh of Davy Tree uh, gave a talk about how risky these dead ash trees really are. You know, there was a study that was done in 2013 <clears throat> that, discussed, that suggested that trees that had lost as little of, as a third of their canopy, okay, they had 30% canopy thinning, they were structurally much less sound than a tree that has not lost any of its canopy due to emerald ash borer. And, uh, you know, Tim uh, has told me that he's expecting another article coming out this spring in Arboriculture and Urban Forestry that shows that dying ash branches are incredibly brittle. It's almost, they're almost like styrofoam. And the picture I have over here is a photo I took of a tree uh, that you see uh, in the center part of the canopy, there's a branch that broke. And this, this break is about 30 feet off the ground. And that's typically what emerald ash, what, what the ash trees do. They're just gonna just drop a branch in the limb, even on a windless day, uh, they'll drop a limb. And uh, you, know, you can imagine a limb of that size, you know, falling you know, two feet into the ground, because uh, it, it comes down with that much force. So it's these things are very dangerous, and Tim's gonna talk about uh, on April 2nd at Emerald Ash Borer University, he's going to talk about how dangerous it is and some of the te techniques that professionals uh, should use to uh, keep themselves safe. Uh, one of the things I really want, want, want to emphasize is that, you know, uh, if you have a lot of dead, standing dead ash trees and you want to sort of work out a deal with a neighbor who can cut down the trees for firewood, uh, you know, that might be just all well and good. But remember that when somebody's on your property working on a chainsaw, you may be liable. So you want to make sure that anybody who's doing any work with ash trees is insured uh, because uh, this is a very dangerous, uh, uh, a dangerous operation. And, you know, even if you're cutting down a tree that's next to a dead ash tree, the vibrations of the falling limbs uh, from that tree might actually shake loose a limb. So I just can't emphasize enough how scary it is. And, you know, so I hope you're scared <laughs> of dead ash trees because, you know, we don't have to have ash trees that die and become brittle, we can actually keep them alive. So uh, let me, before I go into how the insecticides protect the ash trees, I would like to just review uh, how emerald ash borer kills trees. And I've shown this slide several times before, but you know, what happens is that we've got, and you see on, on the left side, you see uh, larvae of varying sizes. These larvae feed just beneath the bark, okay, in the cambium area. And as the larvae get bigger and bigger, they will start etching and notching the uh, sapwood, okay, the, the, uh, the xylem. And, and the EAB, I mean, excuse me, ash trees are what we call ring porous species, which means that they only have one ring of active xylem, active conducting tubes that pump the water from the roots up to the leaves. When they start etching, these uh, functional xylem, they'll, they will actually uh, dry out the, the tree, uh, make the tree uh, uh, lose its ability to produce out new leaves, and it becomes very fragile in a hurry. 
<clears throat> the MLS spore right now, uh, it is uh, February. They should be under the bark. Uh, as the slide says here in October through April, the, in what we call this J-shaped sta stage. Uh, and uh, come uh, late April, they will pupate. Uh, and then they will, uh, they, they will come out in May. They, they will fly uh, by making the characteristic D-shaped exit holes in the trunk. They will then mate in uh, the months of May and June. The adults will feed, females will feed on the leaves so that she can mature her eggs. Uh, and then in July, she lays eggs, which hatch into larvae, which start the cycle and causing the zigzag gallery all over again. So uh, how do the insecticides kill the AB? Well, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> when you inject a tree with uh, uh, an insecticide, the poison leaves uh, will actually, uh, the, the, the insecticide is accumulated into the leaf and the adult beetle that feeds on the leaf will be killed before she can lay eggs, okay? Also, uh, the cambium uh, it becomes poisoned with the insecticide and the larvae uh, are also killed, all right? So, so it's sort of a, a two-way killing approach. It kills the adults feeding on the leaves and it kills the larvae that are feeding on the vascular tissue just beneath the bark of the tree. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, you know, this is all well and good in theory, but, you know, does it really work? Well, there's been some really nice work that was done by Deb McCulloch uh, that was published in December uh, of the Journal of Economic Entomology. And what she did is she worked with, with trees that were, uh, that were forest grown, that had a diameter at breast height. Uh, and just to refresh you, uh, a diameter at breast height means that if you are standing in front of a tree and you put your hand on one side, of the tree of the trunk and you put your hand on the other side of the, tr of the trunk, that's about how far apart your hands are gonna be. Okay, so she was working on trees that uh, had a DBH uh, between 21 and 31 inches DBH. These are very tall trees. And what she did was she, uh, some trees were treated with nothing. Uh, other trees were treated with a dinotefuran either once every three years or annually. Uh, some was treated with emamectin benzoate at five mils per inch, uh, which is what's called the high rate. Some was, was treated at a low rate, two and a half mils per inch. And then other stuff was treated once every three years with the metoclopred or annually with the metoclopred. And what you can see in this graph uh, on, on the right hand, uh, on the, uh, the right, <clears throat> you'll see that the tall bars uh, refer to trees that have a, a high density of of larvae. So these trees were dissected six years after the study was started. And in the control <coughs> trees, you can see that, the, that there was about 35 larvae per uh, square meter of bark, okay? Which is not significantly different from the dinotefuran treated trees, okay? And uh, because of all this variation, it's really, even though you had low numbers, lower numbers of larvae in the imidacloda tree, treated trees, uh, it's not significantly different from uh, the imidacloprid treated uh, trees. But what, what's really interesting is that in both treatments of the trees treated with emamectin benzoate, there simply were no larvae present six years after the study uh, was started. And so these, these trees were treated once every, every three years, okay? Uh, we still see that, uh, that, that, the, that you can keep that uh, level, the density of, uh, of larvae down to just about zero. So this is pretty much definitive proof, uh, at least from uh, the larval densities of, of those trees in, in, in a forest study. Okay, um, so um, another study was done in uh, Hazelcrest, Illinois. It was a seven year study that was done in canopy thinning. It seems it's done by uh, Emily Brick and others. Uh, it's interestingly enough, uh, you know, both of these studies came out in 2018. But what I wanna direct you is, is you see a bunch of, squi of squiggly lines on the right side with this graph. And this refers to canopy thinning. So the, the solid blue line uh, refers to the uh, amount of canopy that is being lost on the untreated trees. And you can see that by 2004, that even though they started out with about 10% canopy thinning starting out, the control trees by 2014 had lost about 80% of their canopy. In contrast, there's this broken blue line on the bottom, the emamectin benzoate treatment. Uh, this is one actually had a lot lower uh, rates of canopy thinning compared to uh, the controls. And uh, all these neonicotinoids, the uh, 
imidacloprid uh, and the dinotefiran, they all have middling levels of, 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 of protection over here. So here's another study that shows when you use canopy thinning as the measure of efficacy, of effectiveness, uh, in, in this uh, neighborhood in Hazelcrest, Illinois, just outside of Chicago, it shows that it works quite well. Okay, And these were rather, rather small trees, much smaller than the McCulloch's work. Uh, the initial DBHs were between 13 and 15 inches. Uh, in a study that uh, we did in uh, Indianapolis in Eagle Creek Park, uh, you see on the left uh, a one of the study trees that was treated with emamectin benzoate. It's fully alive. You look at the tree on the right. Uh, it's dead. And, you know, I have my six-foot-tall graduate student, uh, who was a graduate student at the time, Donnie Peterson. Uh, he's pretty small in relationship to the tree, so these are pretty good-sized trees. The average DBH of the trees was about 40 inches. Okay, so this is like as, these are almost as wide as your as your dinner table. Um, so we, we injected it first in 2013, and when we first started, the uh, trees were somewhere about somewhere between 10 and 15 percent canopy thinning, uh, and then by 2014, uh, there was really not much difference in canopy thinning. But from 2015, we started seeing a, a big increase in the in the control lines in, in the control of trees, up to 60 percent canopy thinning. 2016. 90, and then by 2017, we hit 100% uh, canopy thinning. Uh, trees that were treated in the springtime, okay, in June, uh, their canopy thinning uh, you know, never got above 20% throughout the course of the entire six-year study when they were injected once in 2013 and again in 2016. Um, when we uh, look at <clears throat> the, the product that was uh, applied in the fall, which allowed them to feed for an entire, another whole summer, there was an actual cost of delaying it. You know, because they fed for a whole other summer, instead of having a peak uh, ca uh, uh, canopy thinning being 20%, it was actually 40% canopy thinning. So, you know, this tells you that even though while you can suppress additional damage by ejecting into the fall, uh, when you are late in the invasion cycle, um, you know, I think you uh, uh, lose about, uh, you lose quite a bit. So, you know, there are a number of, of other products, you know, that work. Imidacloprid, you know, uh, and dinotefiran are the uh, uh, neonicotinoids. And th in this uh, chart over here, you can see that none of these products kill the eggs. All the products kill the first instar and the second instar. But the imidacloprid and the dinotefiran do not touch the third and fourth instars. Uh, Emamectin benzoate is the most toxic to the adults, uh, whereas the uh, imidacloprid just can only uh, they can only they they can have some sustained feeding. It's not it's not that toxic, and azadiractin works in a very different way. It's not toxic, but it just reduces the fecundity of adults. And in the study which I've shown in the past, you know, just sort of demonstrates this is a study done in Oakville, Ontario, on some oh 15 inch diameter trees, and we can see on the left hand side that. Most of the bars here are gray, whereas on the right-hand side, towards by 2016, most of the bars are red, which suggests that there is some protection going on, a lot of protection going on, uh, when the trees are, are, are treated prior to the infestation of uh, uh, emerald ash borer in, in the trees. Okay, uh, a lot of this information is summarized in this insecticide options for protecting ash trees for emerald ash borer. Uh, Deb and I and Dan Herms, uh, we've been working on developing a new version for this, and we expect it to be out before April. We have the text all done, and it's in uh, various forms to be going to the printer. So I can say with certainty, it'll be out this year. So if you want something to look at, you can uh, look at emeraldashboard.info. It'll be available as a PDF, and you'll be able to look at it. Okay, <coughs> we all know that Ash trees are certainly worth uh, worth saving. And I just want to go through this little exercise. There's something called the tree benefit calculator, which tells you uh, the annual benefits from an ash tree. You put in your zip code. Uh, you put in what, what species. Uh, on a 20-inch white ash, we get about $230 per year of benefits uh, in terms of property value, stormwater processing, uh, uh, and uh, reduced heating and cooling costs. Now, uh, this is sort of a simple back of the napkin uh, calculation 
for what it would take to maintain a 20 inch ash tree and protect it from emerald ash borer. Uh, removal and replacement costs would be about $880, assuming that the tree was not next to a house. If it was next to a house, you could probably triple that. Uh, it includes removal of uh, and stump grime, uh, uh, removing of the tree and grinding the stump. Uh, replacement costs, assuming it's $400 to buy, stake a two inch DBH tree. The treatment cost would be uh, $881, assuming that we're treating it in year one, four, seven, and 10, and that the tree grows about a half an inch per year, accumulates more diameter each year. Uh, and uh, so if you look at the net received value uh, from a 24 inch DBH, uh, from, from a tree uh, that grows from 20 inches to 24 inch DBHs uh, using this, uh, the, the tree uh, benefit calculator, uh, the value is going to be um, $1,658. Uh, so you'll be ahead. Uh, so even though your cost for treatment is $881 and your move and replacement cost will be $880, it's still about, it's about the same. Because you're getting value each year from that tree, uh, you know, you're getting a value of $2,500. Even after you deduct your cost, you're going to be ahead about $1,600. So that's uh, one way of justifying uh, treating a tree. It just it costs less, and, and, and you're getting more value from that tree. So <clears throat> one of the questions we wanted to take a look at was to figure out, you know, when is it too late to initiate a control program? Because, you know, the, the trees are declining. You know, um, we know that you have a very good chance of protecting a tree when you have less than 10% canopy thinning. A uh, reasonably good control chance of protecting it when there's less than thirty when there's uh, up to thirty percent canopy thinning. But once you get above that, you know you're simply the tree's too weak to, to save. So I think I presented this earlier in a couple of other talks uh, that you know we uh, use this doubling model to predict the rate at which trees decline, and we validated by looking at the at the removal of fourteen thousand ash trees from the street of Fort Wayne. Uh, not that Clinton Avenue Street, that you, Street, Clinton Street that you saw in, in the first slide at the beginning of this talk. And uh, you can see that, you know, in year one in 2006, you know, there was about uh, the first year of the cycle, uh, there was less than, a, there was about 1% of the trees removed. In year two, there was 2% of the trees removed. Year three, four, then we go to eight, 16, 32, 64, to 100% removed. And so our predicted model, this this doubling model, uh, pretty much predicted the actual uh, removal uh, rate. Uh, so, um, so if you know how many trees are removed, you know where you are in, in, in the decline. Uh, we also found that in uh, Lafayette, Indiana, and also in Indianapolis, we could figure out how many more, you know, where you were in this uh, decline cycle just by tracking the number of trees that had lost more than 30% of their canopy thinning. So we see that, you know, with, with the exception of 2012, when we had a historic drought, the trees looked pretty bad due to abiotic uh, constraints due to the lack of water. Uh, we see that it pretty much snaps to this two, this uh, doubling model uh, towards the end of the end of the cycle. Um, same thing uh, in Indianapolis, uh, uh, where we where we started late in the cycle in year six. Uh, when we had about 30%, uh, 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 close to 40% of the trees that have lost more than 30% of the canopy, the model really tells you where you are. And that's kind of useful to us because, you know, we know that it's really hard to, to detect uh, canopy decline early in, in, in the cycle, okay? Because, you know, if you're looking for trees that have lost more than 30% of their canopy, they may be scattered early if you only have one out of every 100 ash trees having this symptom. But once you start having you know, about four or eight percent, which is about, you know, one in uh, 12 or one in 25 of your trees showing these, uh, this uh, thinning, they become more easy to detect. But it's, it's hard to get people to rally. It's easier to get people to rally about uh, treatment when you start noticing all your trees have lost, when you notice about, you know, a, a third of your trees, when your trees have really start losing a lot of their county, but it's usually too late at, at, at that point in time. So, you know, we've done some work with our emerald ash borer cost calculator, which I, I've talked to you about before, that allows you to stage your response to an EAB invasion based on the percentage of trees that have lost more than 30% of your canopy. So if you're a city forester, just randomly pick, you know, 50 trees 
get an estimate of the percentage of the trees that have lost more than 30% of the, your canopy. And then that'll tell you where you are in your cycle and how much time you have left before you have a chainsaw, you, you, you have a chainsaw operation where you're just trying to sort of uh, remove trees. Uh, in this representative trees of uh, a forest uh, where I, I plugged in uh, an ash inventory over here with uh, trees of different size classes, uh, assuming a bulk treatment, and it was going to cost about five dollars per inch treating once every th every three years. You know, I found that um, if you start in year one, um, you know the uh, the, the, the black line shows a real, it's very expensive in the last three years when you're removing all your trees. Where at, at, whereas if you start in year five, you know, and you, and you do the same thing, it's even more expensive because you're compressing those removals. But in all cases, <coughs> if you are uh, treating your trees, which is this blue line, your costs never really approach those peaks of either proactively removing your trees, which is uh, the red line, or, the, or uh, removing your trees as they die, which is the black line. Uh, the cumulative cost comparison uh, is about, it shows that over a 25 year period, it, your, your out of pocket expenses are going to be a lot lower if you are replacing, uh, if, if you're, you're treating all your trees that are greater than 12 inches in size, just saving all your large trees, uh, whether you start in year one or you wait until you have uh, year five when 16% when or one out of six trees are beyond saving. So, you know, uh, if your community needs to start, needs to see a few dead ash trees, uh, you can use that to your advantage. But really, you don't want to wait till much beyond 16% uh, of your trees. One out of every six trees are showing the symptoms because you run the risk of not being able to save to save your trees. Uh, the relative benefits of these things, you know, if you save more trees, uh, these graphs here represent the uh, size of your forest based on the sum of all the DBHs of all the trees, some of the widths of all the trees. You know, if you cut down your trees and you replace them with small trees, your forest is going to be a lot smaller. So this just shows that uh, saving your trees uh, winds up giving you a much larger forest community. Okay, <clears throat> so, um, well, you know, uh, we know that we like to do things at, uh, we like to do things early, but that's not always the case. Uh, we have a case three case studies where we started protecting trees in West Lafayette, where uh, in year four of the ash decline cycle, okay, um, where uh, we had 8% uh, of the trees showing uh, decline. Uh, we did this in uh, Terre Haute uh, as well, but they were 16%. Uh, and then we started it again in Bloomington, where there was about a third of the trees which were, were unsal unsalvageable. So, you know, we wanna know, you know, what, what happens to the ash forest if we start protecting these trees at varying stages. And, well, <clears throat> in West Lafayette, we were, we, the untreated uh, trees are, are, are the black line and the, the, the dash line, which is gonna be same for all these graphs, are the predicted uh, loss for the trees using our doubling model. So basically, you know, if we didn't treat any of the trees, we would have expected all the trees to be dead by year 2017 with no canopy left. Uh, the untreated trees uh, did not quite reach this level, um, but uh, trees that were treated with either Zytec, which is a, 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 a midocloprid uh, product, or um, trees that uh, were treated with, uh, with trees that were treated with arvermectin, only there was a change from the initial to the end. We lost only about 16% uh, increase in uh, trees that had lost more than 30% of their canopy. Uh, Zytec was about maybe 28%, so it was a little bit more. And uh, almost 70% of the trees, uh, <clears throat> you know, 70% increase in the number of trees that had lost more than 30% of their canopy compared to 92%. So clearly, saving the trees you know, early on definitely has a benefit. But what if we roll this back another year, and here we only treated with triage, which is the amamectin benzoate product, or, uh, uh, and compared that with nothing. And we found that even if you, uh, if you started uh, you know, uh, later in, in, in the game, uh, you know, we wound up having a 19% increase uh, in, in trees that we lost compared to a 45% increase. And this is kind of exciting to us 
uh, because, you know, because we treated 40% of the trees, there's a bit of a halo effect, which we think is going on. We think that, you know, because the beetle is flying from tree to tree, uh, before they lay their eggs, they wanted to, uh, they have to feed on leaves to mature their eggs. We think that there's an advantage to, uh, to treating uh, nearby trees so that you may not have to treat actually every single tree. You may want to treat maybe every other tree, especially if the canopy is touching. Uh, so uh, we are actually going to be exploring that further uh, with the data sets that, that we have here to see what critical di uh, distances uh, are, are, are necessary. Okay, now one of the things we found was that when you start in year six, when uh, the average canopy thinning is about you know, close to 40% uh, in, in uh, the campus of Bloomington, uh, we found that you know, uh, we were able to arrest the uh, progress, the accumulation of, of uh, trees which were un unable to be sa saved, but they were still like in all the other ones, about a 20% increase over time. Uh, in, in the number of trees that were available uh, that we could that we could protect, but um, uh, the untreated trees, you know, there is still a bit of a halo effect. But you know, where we we've lost about eighty five percent of the trees uh, that were not that were not treated. It's still maybe ten percent. It's about it's about fifteen percent less than would have been, would have happened had we treated none of them. But you know, we are uh, are not saving nearly as many trees. So you know, the take home point you know for that one over there is that. You know, some trees can be saved uh, even if starting after uh, more than 30, more than a third of the trees have lost more than 30, a third of their canopy in year six. Um, treating 40% of the trees slows the mortality of untreated trees. And of course, more trees are saved if you start earlier. So this brings to mind this whole concept of a urban community EAB action cycle, all right? You know, um, what we want to do is, you know, because I know this, this webinar reaches people all over the country. You know, if you are just in the early stages where emerald ash borer has been found in your state, you know, you really want to get people to be thinking that they have ash in their trees. And I tell you something, I have talked to so many communities who told me that they didn't have any ash trees. And then once emerald ash borer came in and they saw all the dead trees, that that's when they found out how many ash trees they really had. So getting a good inventory is really, really important as a first step, you know, for all communities to get an idea what amount of resources they have that are at risk. Uh, you can in increase uh, ash awareness through uh, tree tagging programs where you might, you know, put purple bands around ash trees, you know, to get people aware of what the amount of resources that are at risk. But you should start looking at some trees on, on, on a regular basis once it's found in your county uh, to just to see where you are in the ash decline cycle. And so what I have here in, is if you can track the percentage of trees that have lost more than 30% of their, of their uh, canopy, that'll tell you where you are. And this is these solid squares you know, which I call affected ash. Uh, the diamonds is the, is the theoretical abundance of emerald ash borer in your community. Um, and uh, so, you know, we think that, you know, the emerald ash borers are going to be around for a while. And once you have, you know, 100% of your trees have lost more than 30% of their canopy, you know, you know, the ash borers will probably still stick around, but you're starting to lose uh, the amount of phloem or amount of, of plant tissue that are available to keep those uh, ash borers alive. And then, you know, once they really lose uh, uh, the amount of food, the population will crash, but it'll never goes down to zero. And it'll come back in, in a certain period. So during the, uh, so once you notice emerald ash borers there, you want to start controlling as soon as you possibly can, somewhere between year one and year six, uh, the closer you get to year one, the, the more trees you're going to be winding up saving. And so I call this the aggressive phase. You know, during that initial invasion wave, be as aggressive as you possibly can afford to protect as many trees as you can. Afterwards, uh, after all the untreated trees are dead, uh, you want, you'll go into a maintenance phase. And you could stop treating once every three years and then start treating uh, only when you start noticing fresh uh, canopy injury. And uh, I would think that, you know, if you, if you started noticing fresh canopy injury and you're uh, an urban forester, I would, I would treat all the ash trees as many as you can in that, in that one year with an emmectin benzoate product in order to uh, 
uh, really knock back that population so it doesn't, you know, get, get, get rolling again. And, uh, you know, uh, so I think that while you may not have to continue treating your trees after that first 10 years uh, on a three-year interval, you're going to look, you're going to have to look at these trees once a year. And I think arborists who are in the audience, uh, you know, um, this is what I like to think of as the plant health care model. You know, you are on people's properties for lots of reasons. And uh, if you can include in your services inspecting your ash trees, you know, you can charge for that as well. You know, and I think it might be a good way to stay in, in touch with, 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 with your clients. Okay. So uh, one of the ways of communicating uh, ash <clears throat> decline, uh, I know I've, I've talked about the Purdue Tree Doctor app before. This is an app that's available for $1.99. It, it, uh, it's uh, available at purdueplantdoctor.com. Uh, uh, you can get this app on your smartphone, and uh, you can look up ash trees uh, and, and find the emerald ash borer, and then you can get this nice photo on there that you can show your clients to show what you mean when you start talking about canopy thinning. You know, um, I know that, you know, uh, the ability of your clients to believe what you say uh, depends on the relationship you have with your client and also the source of information. If you can show these pictures from Purdue uh, that show uh, canopy thinning, they know that you're really not, not, not making this, this stuff up. So we hope that can, it can give you some, some credibility. And um, we are not in, in a get rich, quick scheme you know we're selling these things at a dollar 99 a piece so uh, and once you buy it you know you get free updates you know pretty much for life so it's not the kind of thing where uh we're trying to squeeze money out of you <laughs> from purdue over here so okay with that i think that was my last slide that i have over here and i'd like to open the floor uh for, for some questions all right thanks cliff i'm checking the our chat here. Let's see what we can find. What do we tell people who are organic in our community? Oh, <clears throat> well, what you tell them is that uh, they can use the um, uh, the the neem product, the triazin, or uh, the 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 uh, the product that I, I showed you, the triazin, that works quite well if they uh, if they start before uh, the tree has started showing symptoms of decline. It works. Um, Sorry, I, I got rid of my. Another one says, "I heard on the news that extreme cold will would kill the boar." <clears throat> Is that true? Oh, great question. You know, I was thinking that I should have mentioned that this morning. Um, yes. Okay. So uh, there's been some really interesting work that's been done in Minnesota. Uh, you know, Rob Vanette is part of it. He works for the U.S. Forest Service. He's part of a team of people that have been looking at this. And what they found was that at minus 10 Fahrenheit, uh, it's, so what they've done, there's two things that are going on. Okay. First of all, we have to remember that insects like people and plants can produce antifreezes. Okay, and, and my best example that I could think about this is uh, think about what happened last Wednesday when it was just freezing cold and you go outside and your nose starts running. That's our body's response to pushing antifreezes into our nose so that uh, th th that runny nose keeps our nose from freezing. Okay, so our body produces antifreezes. Insects also produce antifreezes in response to the cold, okay? But they have a certain, but it can only work for, for so much. Just like, you know, no matter how much your nose is going to run, eventually, if it gets cold enough, your nose will freeze off, okay? Uh, same thing goes for insects, all right? So uh, it turns out that at minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit, if you can chill a larva to that cold, uh, you will lose, that will kill 97% of the uh, emerald ash borer if you cool down if you cool them down this is for like a, i think it's for a, a 24 or 48 hour period uh, if you cool them down to minus 20 you might lose about 75 uh, percent if you go down to minus 10 uh you're going to lose about 25 percent so at about minus 15 degrees fahrenheit okay uh you're going to lose about 50 percent of your emerald ash borer now, uh, the thing is, is that uh, 
it has to be cold for, for, for a long period of time for that, that to work because the, the, the trees, okay, uh, act as insulators. So, you know, there is, you know, especially on the bigger trees where the bark is pretty thick, it's going to take a while for the tree to cool down to that temperature. So there's a bit of a lag. So it's kind of like if you had, uh, imagine you took a, a tray of ice water and you put it directly in your freezer, uh, it would turn to ice you know, at a certain, you know, maybe after two hours or so. But let's say you put that tray of ice water into a cooler, a styrofoam cooler, and then put the styrofoam cooler into the freezer. It might take, you know, eight hours for that ice to, to thaw because that ice would be insulated for a period of time. Okay, so the trees act as an insulator. So the thing is, is that in certain parts of the country, uh, during this deep freeze that happened uh, last Wednesday, uh, in the polar vortex, well, that last Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, you know, like say in Minnesota, you know, uh, a large part of the a large part of the area, they may have lost, uh, they may have, you know, a lot of the emerald ash borer probably died up in Minnesota, maybe in northern Wisconsin as well. But you know, uh, we've had these polar vortexes before, and uh, not all of them are going to die. Okay, so I know in Indiana, you know, it was cold, but it was only cold. It was minus seventeen degrees. Uh, and uh, it was only there for about just a couple of hours when it was that cold. So these, so the emerald ash borer really uh, are going to be thriving, you know, quite well. And as you, as you go, I know I was I drove down to uh, Evansville on Thursday, and even though like our our coldest temperature was minus 17 up here in Lafayette, which is north of Indianapolis, down in Evansville the coldest temperature got down to maybe like you know minus five. So, you know, uh, if you're south of Indianapolis, you know, don't, you know, your emerald ash borer are going to be fine. But if you're in the northern part, you may lose some, but, they, but they'll, they'll thrive and you're still going to need some protection for, from them. All right. The next question is, any evidence that EAB will feed on lilac or other species of tree? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, uh, emerald ash borer uh, is no uh, 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 feeds on plants in the olive family. Okay, and lilacs uh, are very closely related to emerald ash borer. But there's but the studies that have been done have shown that that they that they cannot uh, attack them. They do attack uh, the white fringe tree, uh, the native white fringe tree, Cyanothus virginica, which uh, grows. Uh, in uh, the southeastern part of the United States, uh, and there's even, you know, by southeast, it even it can even be it can be planted in you know even in Indiana and places like that. Uh, but uh, and uh, these trees are indeed attacked by emerald ash borer. Um, it took us a while. It took a while for uh, Don uh, Cipollini to um, uh, uh, report this. He he was the one who reported it in, in Ohio. Uh, and it took a while for people to find it because, you know, these, these trees are, are constantly being attacked by other borers and they're multi-trunk, uh, multi-stemmed, uh, small tree. So, so, brand, so, so trunks are dying and then they sprout back up all the time. So it took a while for it to notice. Um, so, uh, but, you know, other than, than the white fringe tree, in North America, there really is not a lot. Uh, that that they're they're attacking and they're, they're so they're not really moving over to other other trees. Thank you. Um, the next question is: A tree whose decline has been arrested by treatment never recovers its canopy. Uh, a tree that's in decline. Okay. Just say that again. I'm not, I don't quite understand that question. It just says a tree whose decline has been arrested by treatment. <clears throat> oh, okay. So in other okay, words, the, tree, the decline has stopped because <laughs> it's yeah. treated. It never recovers a canopy. Ah, uh, okay. All right. So, so I, I guess what the question you want that that was asked is that, let's say you have a tree that has lost thirty percent of its canopy, and you injected it in the spring. Okay, so that the, so that there was no more canopy being lost, or maybe another five, just maybe another ten percent of the canopy was lost. So that at the peak of canopy loss, you might have lost about forty percent of the canopy. Will that tree always lose forty? Will Will you ever recover that canopy? And the answer is, yes, you can recover the canopy. So what happens is that uh, a tree that was infested that is now somewhat cured of emerald ash borer, okay, because all the dead 
all the uh, larvae that are in there have been killed, okay, those branches that were unable to produce leaves because they were too weak, okay, they have to be pruned off because those branches are dead, all right? But the remaining tree, so, let, so let's say you have a tree that's lost 40% of its canopy. You remove the dead part of the tree, and the 60%, which is still alive, is, is quite healthy. And it'll start sprouting new branches, new shoots, and over time, over the years, it'll, it'll turn into, uh, it can turn into a nice tree, depending on which branches were, were, were left over there. So, for example, so in the, the photo that you have in front of you here that says Purdue Plant Doctor, the one that says 50% thin, you know, the reality is, is that if you injected that tree with MMAC and benzoate that, was, that lost half its canopy, you can keep the live half alive. But the problem is that, you know, once you, remove, once you envision that tree without that central leader, there's not much of a tree left. Whereas the one which is about 30% canopy thinning, you imagine the, the, the uh, dead part on the left is knocked off. You could shape that into a fine looking tree over time. Okay, so that's kind of what's going on. So once you, so once you uh, uh, kill the emerald ash borer that's in the tree, uh, the living part is going to be quite, quite, quite healthy. Okay, the next one is, can birds be harmed by eating EAB? Treated EAB or other ash-eating insects? Okay, can er, birds be harmed by eating treated EAB? Um, well, I, I, the uh, these uh, emamectin benzoate and the dinotefran does not have a high, it's not very toxic to birds. And uh, the birds, so the insects that... Uh, if the insect is still feeding, especially for the amamectin benzoate, you know, it only takes a few bites. If it's still feeding, it probably hasn't, doesn't have the insecticide inside of it yet, if it's an adult beetle, okay? Um, the larvae, okay, uh, the only time that you're gonna have larvae, large larvae, that have a lot of insecticide in them is in that first year when the, w w when the treatment occurs. Okay, because, you know, the small, the, the, the uh, in years after, in the second year of treatment, there are no larvae inside those treated trees because all the young larvae will die after they take the first few bites, okay, when they hatch from the egg. So the only time when you're going to have any contaminated larvae would be uh, in the first year that you're treating it. So there's going to be very few larvae in there and, and they'd have to find it. And the other thing is that the, the, the woodpeckers that are looking for these things, they, um, they respond to sound. And uh, so that when, when they bang on the, to the tree and they hear a hollow spot, that's what they're going to feed on. But I think they also respond to the actual movement of the larva that's underneath the bark. And if it's dead and it's not moving, they may not be able to find it. Okay. Okay. Um, are there any effects from the insecticide treatments on other insects, i.e. bees, butterflies, and other beneficials? And before you answer that, um, I just wanted to say that we do have on the emeraldashboard.info site a document that talks about that as well, in case you'd like to look at that after the webinar. Yeah, yeah it's an FAQ or frequently asked question sheet uh, for what are the uh, non-target impacts. Well, one of the things that we, rec that we know for sure is that uh, ash are wind pollinated. And uh, we do know that, that, that while there may be some uh, uh, emamectin benzoate that can get into the, uh, uh, it, into the, the pollen, there, there's not, the concentration is not very, very high. Uh, and uh, I also know that uh, we have treated, so we have two ash trees at our apiary uh, at Purdue. All right, and uh, I treated those, those and, and, and our apiary is, is a pretty big deal at Purdue. Apiary is basically a, our, our, the place where we have all our beehives. And uh, we, have, uh, we have several multi-million dollar grants that are at stake over there. Uh, and uh, you know, the fellow who had, folks who were running the, the, the apiary wanted me to protect their trees. So uh, I injected those trees knowing that if I was wrong, uh, we would lose uh, these multiple million dollars worth of investments in research and lose if we lost all those bee colonies. I injected those trees uh, last year and uh, 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 these trees are, are, are doing quite well, 
Okay. So what I would recommend that you do is that, you know, is, is that when you inject your trees with MLA, with, with MMectin benzoate, okay, um, you are doing it after the trees have flowered. Because remember, ash trees bloom before the leaves come out. Okay. So uh, if you're injecting when the leaves are coming out, you're doing it after the flowers have come out. All right. So that's, so, so, so what happens is that, uh, the flowers that come out after an injection will be a year after the tree has been injected. One of the things we know that, you know, Matt Gintel and I have been doing some work on concentrations of, of, of material. There's almost like a 90% reduction in the concentration of material in the following year. So you're going to have only 10% of what's, what's out there. So what's left is just going to be just minuscule and really is not going to be a threat to, to pollinators. Now, the other thing is that, you know, yes, th there are caterpillars that may be feeding on uh, ash trees. Uh, but, you know, if you have dead at trees which have been killed by emerald ash borer, those caterpillars are going to have nothing to feed on anyway. So, you know, we're only going to be, be uh, saving a small subset of the trees. So I don't think that we are going to be causing uh, the extinction of any uh, ash feeding caterpillars. Okay. Um, all right. The next one, I think you've already answered. Um, wanted to know if the extreme cold in Michigan maybe killed EAB, uh, but I think we were pretty much kind of in the same boat as Indiana and yeah. Wisconsin on this one. Um, yeah, they killed some. They might kill some, but not enough to matter. Okay. Okay, it says, what area on the tree does EAB enter and is it visible to aid in early detection? Okay, um, all right, so Emma, this, this, the, the problem with this bug, I mean, a couple of years ago, we used to call it the green menace. I think we still do. Uh, it's a bright green beetle, but it's a green, it's a, it's a green beetle that's three quarters of an inch in size, so, that's a, maybe a, a three eighths of an inch in size to a half inch in size, and it's flying in a green canopy. So they're really hard to find, okay? And I have looked for eggs, and they are really hard to find, all right? Um, they, they lay them in the cracks and crevices of uh, the trunk, okay? So it's going to be hard to find an egg. So what happens is that the adult, remember, the adult beetle is feeding on the leaf of a, of a tree, okay? And then uh, it lays its egg on the trunk, okay? the egg hatches and the, the larvae hatches from that egg and then bores directly from the side of the egg that's glued onto the trunk and it goes right into the wood so it's not crawling around so there really is no entrance hole per se to see you can see an exit hole so what symptoms are you going to see um well one of the things that, that i like to look for are the woodpecks uh, and you look in the upper part of the tree, because remember the tree, so, so if you, in the slide you see over here, all these trees, any decline on these trees is really shown in the upper part of the tree first, because that's where they start attacking first, all right? Uh, and then as the, the, the infestation progresses, you, know, you see more and more of the lower canopy being affected, all right? And um, so uh, I think canopy thinning uh, and uh, woodpecks, also vertical splits, um, you know, uh, imagine, you know, uh, uh, when the, the, the beetle starts feeding on the uh, vascular tissue, okay, the, uh, when it feeds on the, on the phloem and the cambium, that this tissue that's beneath the bark, it kills the tissue that lays on new bark, all right? So that as the trees grow and the trunk gets, gets expands, okay, the tree can't lay on new bark on the dead part of the trunk. So what happens is that it starts to gap, okay? So the, the live part of the tree expands and it pulls apart the dead part of the, of the trunk and it splits, kind of like, uh, you know, you went too many, uh, uh, you took too many trees at the all you can, excuse me, you took too many trips to the all you can eat buffet and your, 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 belly, your, your shirt's starting to gap around your belly, okay? Uh, you know, it's the same kind of a thing. So those vertical splits are things that you can look at look for as well. I hope that that, that that helps. Okay, <clears throat> let's see if, um, all right. Thinking about boulevard tree management. Yes. 
is there a minimum or a maximum DBH that you would remove and replace versus treating? Okay. Um, so there was a really good study where they did some optimal optimization modeling where uh, they were looking at the, they were looking at the um, optimization of dollars spent on caring for a tree uh, on tree care, to on total tree care. So what, 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 what goes into that model is they were thinking that, you know, in order to get a tree to a 12 inch diameter at breast height, it takes a certain amount of money, right? Uh, it, and uh, in order to protect a tree, it takes another amount of money, all right? And then there's the removal and, re and re replacement costs. You know, but one of the things you, you, you know, I guess since you're asking this question, you're, you're probably well aware of this. If your ash trees are only, have a, have a DBH of only four or five inches in diameter, you could re remove those trees, replace them with something else. And in just a few years, you're going to have a tree that's four or five inches in diameter. So let's say, let's say for arguments purposes, uh, it takes a half, it, you, you, uh, a tree lays on a half inch of bark diameter each year, all right? Uh, if you plant a two inch tree, uh, it takes four years for that tree to become a four inch diameter tree. So, you know, uh, uh, you're not losing very much by replacing smaller trees. So when they did their optimi optimization modeling, what they found was that 12 inch was, 12 inches in diameter was the sweet spot, okay? So if you have trees, that are that are that are smaller than 12 inches in diameter, uh, it doesn't make that much sense to keep them alive. This was done. Yeah, you know, it doesn't make that sense to keep them alive. If the trees are 12 inches and greater, then it makes the most sense to to keep those trees alive. Okay, I, so uh, so I would suggest saving the 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 larger trees because it took your community an awful lot to invest and keep that tree alive. Uh, to 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 that to that point, uh, when I do my you can you can play around with numbers with my cost calculator, uh, you know by playing by, if you by plugging in your inventory to the cost calculator um, in the calculator and then uh, playing out over several scenarios, uh, you know you, you could figure it out because you know you may you may be in a community that uh, has that most of its ash trees are 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 ten inches and greater. Okay, you know. Um, you, know, you you may choose as a community to want to protect those trees because you know it, it took you know uh, because you think that the, the trees are close enough to that 12 inch sweet spot you know to, to be helping you know a tree with a 12 inch uh, diameter at, at, at breast height that that's a fairly sizable tree and you're going to notice a, a, a big difference so you know larger trees are more worthwhile for saving uh, 12 inch is the theoretical uh, cutoff point. But you know, if your if your community wants to save them nine to ten inches or greater, you know that that might work out for you as well. All right, thank you. After EAB has swept through an area, is there any hope in replant, replanting ash back into natural areas, or would the EAB population still be present and ready to attack the replacement trees as well? Okay, um, so ash trees are because of how ash trees grow. Um, they uh, are, are they, it takes a while for the, okay, um, let me just collect my thoughts. Okay, so the emerald ash borer, uh, once they kill a tree, okay, uh, that tree can't produce seeds, but the seedlings are more than likely to be able to produce seeds before uh, they're killed by the, the, the recolonization by emerald ash borer. So what happens is that, you know, there, there's sort of this bit of a cat and mouse game. And so we're never going to run out of emerald ash borer. The emerald ash borer population may get very low, but it never becomes extinct. So in terms of replanting, you know, I just don't think it would ever make sense to replant ash, uh, especially green ash. Some white ash are more resistant than others. Uh, there's a lot of work going on in resistance uh, management. And, and resistance of, of, of emerald ash borer. So by, uh, but I think that you know, there may be a point where we can plant resistant ash. I know we, we've done some work where we've been, we put uh, a green ash on resistant Manchurian ash rootstock. And we found that resistance could be conferred from the roots 
up to the scion. Uh, there's other folks who are doing, who are selecting, um, uh, uh, they're selecting uh, uh, ash trees from uh, very resistant parents, uh, with, with a, and they're and they're they're getting a a, a pretty quick um, a success in that way. So I think that sometime in the next 10 years, I would not be surprised if we found resistant ash that could be replanted. So just keep your eye opening, eye open for that. But uh, don't ever expect emerald ash borer to become eradicated. So between resistant varieties and the introduction of all the parasitic wasps, uh, I think that you know, we could have a vibrant ash forest down the road in the future. But the existing ash forest is gonna take the big hit during that first invasion. Okay, in this next question, I think you've kind of answered it already. Um, will treated trees need to be treated after untreated trees have died? Uh, so yes, the answer to that question is yes. Uh, treated trees will have to be treated after untreated trees have died, although not as frequently. One of the nice things that we know about this emamectin benzoate is that it is pretty toxic to these beetles, all right? And that, you know, so you, what, what I recommend doing is that after all the untreated trees are dead, just cut off your, 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 your treatment. And I don't really know how long that's going to be before you start seeing fresh woodpecks. But when you do start seeing those fresh woodpecks, that's when I would start a new treatment program. And uh, I think, you know, that one treatment might, if you treat all the trees in your boulevard, your municipal forest in that one time, I think that might knock it back for another unknown period. And in my models, uh, in the Emerald Ash Borer Cost Calculator, I'm assuming that you would treat once every five years, and that's being very conservative. It might be one, once every eight or ten. I, I honestly don't know. Okay, let's see. Um, I have heard of arborists performing treatments on white fringe tree. Is this even effective or necessary? It's effective. Uh, it'll protect the fringe tree. It'll keep those uh, it'll keep the um, uh, the branches, it'll keep the, the shoots alive. It'll protect them from emerald ash borer. Um, now, you know, I've seen white fringe tree in lots of different kinds of settings and landscapes. So in botanic gardens where they're growing large white fringe tree and they, they're, they're, they're shaping the specimen and they want to keep that alive, that's when it makes sense to treat it. So if you have a white fringe tree, which is a focal point in your landscape, and it is, and, and, and you like what it looks like and you want to keep the shape and you've been shaping it because you like the character, by all means, treat it. That makes perfect sense. But if you've got a planting that is constantly losing a branch, that it's losing a branch or a, a, a stem every couple of years and it's replaced by another stem, you know, um, treatment may not be, you don't, need, you don't need to treat that tree to keep it alive. Okay, so you can always have a supply of new branches coming along on a regular basis because emerald ash borer isn't going to kill it every single year, all right? So, uh, so I would think that the uh, treatment would be most beneficial if it's a specimen tree. Okay, um, is there any value in using imidacloprid soil soaks, which are less expensive? Oh, there's a lot of value for using imidacloprid soil soaks uh, because uh, you know it can protect it's very effective on the small trees especially trees which are less than 20 inches in diameter you know so if you got a six inch dbh tree and you don't want to spend have an arborist do it for you you can just buy a you know uh, you can buy a quart of this stuff uh, for somewhere between 20 and 30 dollars and that'll treat up to a 10 inch diameter tree so the the the, the rule the uh, sort of working rule of thumb is that uh, one Court will uh, each fluid ounce will treat one inch of circumference. Okay, so a quart will treat a tree with a thirty, which is thirty-two ounces, will treat a tree with a thirty-two inch circumference, which divided by pi, which is three point one four, it's about ten inches in diameter. But the thing is, if you forget to treat it, <laughs> you're in trouble. <laughs> so you have to. So I would just, if you're going to go that way, I would put it on my calendar. Every, you know, soon, like say every uh, May 1st, say, treat my ash trees and treat every May 1st. And, 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 and that, 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 would be, that would work quite well. All right. It looks like we have come to the end of our questions here. Um, folks, if you 
find you have an, a question that you would have liked to ask Cliff after this is over, remember that I will be sending out an email to you and I will put his contact information on it um, so that you could uh, ask him your questions or you know comments and send him those. Um, at this point, it looks like we're good and I am E extremely happy that so many people came to our webinar today and I'm I'm in fact I'm sorry that some people were not able to get on we have not had this kind of um, uh, audience be for quite a long time and so um, our room was at, at capacity at a hundred uh, according to our Michigan State zoom program so that was all they would let us put in uh, so but this will be recorded and posted on the emerald info site on the EAB University page for you uh, by tomorrow so um, if you have other folks you know that would like to hear it it's going to be there so with that um, I'd like to thank you Cliff and thank everyone for being here and uh, I hope everyone has a, a, a good day and stays warm. <laughs> hey, thanks so much for hosting. Thank you. Bye-bye.